Welcome, everyone, to our first annual show for the five spot. Join, I'm your host, Donovan McNabb. I'll be joined with Armando Seguro. And we'll give you the X's and O's and also break down a little bit of the gossip that's going on in the NFL and why things are happening this far in the early part of the season. And I think it's time to start right now with some of the injuries that have happened over the weekend or in the last two weeks and how they're going to change the landscape of these organizations. Uh, I mean, Nick Chubb, obviously, in the big injury that we've seen with his knee last night. Uh, Austin Eckler, Saquon Barkley, uh, Shaq Thompson for the Carolina Panthers, suffered an ankle injury. Aaron Rodgers, as we know, as the Achilles injury. Odell Beckham, uh, any ankle injury he suffered Sunday. Uh, Joe Burrow in the calf, re-aggravating the calf injury. Devontae Adams in the concussion. Uh, Montgomery, as well as Gardner Johnson for Detroit Lions and what they're trying to do over there. But just Armando, let's start us out with what's been going on right now in the talk in Cleveland after losing Nick Chubb last night. Yeah, I mean, Donovan, first first of all, thank you for allowing me to be on your show. Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for joining us. No, no, of course. uh, You know, (laughs) it's going to be fun. We're going to have a great time on the five spot. So this Nick Chubb injury, bro, it's it, it goes beyond the Cleveland Browns, in my estimation. This is one of those things where, look, I'm not comparing it to a war injury, but when men see other men fall and go down and it it, like, it moves you because that that was, that was terrible. Absolutely. ABC didn't show the replay, Mm -hmm. but people got on social media and saw that replay and it was atrocious looking, gruesome. Agreed. And, And the reaction to it, I mean, like, you're an ex-player. You were yes. in the battles uh, on the gridiron. When you see that, does that not go to your heart? Does that not, like, make you, like, that could have been me? You know, the wild part, Armando, is, is you go beyond football. And I think when you see an injury like that, when you're on the field, uh, and a guy that you've been working out with, you've been training with, preparing, uh, you go into battles with, and you see that hit, the only thing that you can think about is his future. Uh, it goes beyond the game. It goes beyond the X's and O's. It's more about hopefully, and you're praying to yourself that this is not a seizing injury, injury, let alone a life-threatening injury. And, and I think for Nick Chubb, who suffered a knee injury back in college, I believe, and then suffered another one uh, just a couple years ago, the tough part about it for Nick is he's 75% of that offense. Uh, and now what does that do for Stefanski? in this offense going forward, um, you know, for their passing game and more importantly for their run game. Remember, Kareem Hunt's no longer there. So now it's kind of going to be a makeshift kind of a running attack. But again, for Nick Chubb, I mean, he's it, arguably he's the one or two as far as the best running back in the NFL. And to see him go down like that on national TV is tough for all former athletes and active active athletes. You know what it also does? It it really joins the argument and the debate about running backs getting paid. And Bring now, it. you know, I know what happens next. Running yes. backs are going to say, this is the reason we should get paid. You know 100%. what clubs are going to say? This is the reason you shouldn't get paid because you're yes. out there. And at any moment, if we invest huge dollars in you, Right. This could happen, and now the huge dollars are on IR. Well, it's funny, again, because the names that I mentioned, there are three running backs in that list that are major to their organization, meaning Austin Eckler. He he battled for the rest of the running backs to try to get new contracts because he's trying to get a new contract. Saquon Barkley, a guy who stood on the front line, uh, started the Zoom call, he and Derrick Henry, to talk to the other running backs about getting a contract. And then Nick Chubb being a big supporter uh, of being able to try to uplift the running back position because of how important they are to ball clubs. And then you throw Montgomery in there in Detroit of what he was doing over in Detroit in a run game to take pressure off of Jared Goff. But again, it, it goes back to the decision has to be made for these running backs to get a little bit more attention in what they are. And the tough part about it is, it's not just the running backs that are in a, in a bad situation. Receivers in a bad situation. Tight ends are in a bad situation. Look, Cleveland, Cleveland lost their best offensive tackle 
or offensive lineman just two weeks ago in the first first game of the season. And he was the he was their best player. Uh, and so I just think for where we are right now in the running back situation, to see Nick Chubb go down is heartbreaking because he, he's such a great player. He's such a, a good guy in the community out there in Cleveland. They really stand behind him. Uh, and I hope he was able to bounce back from this injury and come back and play at that high level that he was playing with before the injury. What's your confidence level that Deshaun Watson, who's speaking of contracts, a right. very large contract, fully right. guaranteed, $230 million. What's right. your confidence that he can put that team on his shoulders now that arguably their best offensive player is out for the season? Well, the funny thing you bring up, I mean, with this contract, I mean, we can go about six, seven quarterbacks right now with big contracts that aren't playing well. But as far as Deshaun Watson is concerned, Kevin Stefanski is going to now reopen this offense. And I say reopen this offense because I think what he's going to do is he's going to bring more of that Minnesota type of offense over now to Cleveland where the quarterback position is going to be 50, 60% of what they do. But then you'll see more of Amari Cooper. You'll see more of Peoples Jones. You'll see more of uh, their tight ends and, and a little bit less of their running attack. So I expect Deshaun to throw the ball about 35, 40 times a game but more intermediate passing game, more ball control, more moving the chains and controlling the clock type of passing game. Yes, he'll take his shots, but I think it'll be more of throwing less than 15 yards in about 75% of his passes. And that right there now puts Cleveland more in a bad, good situation because their defense is strong. If you look at their defense last night, it, that was a defensive game. It felt like watching Tech Bowl uh, being played by some of your friends where it just seems like you keep picking the same same play and the defense just keeps stopping them. But I just think for now, the Cleveland Browns are going to be the team that everyone's going to watch more of Deshaun Watson. But I think really the bullseye should be more on Kevin Stefanski. Yeah, asking, I got to tell you, asking Kevin Stefanski to throw the ball more is yeah. like asking the devil to do good things, do good <laughs> deeds. It, it's like, that's not in his, D, his DNA is to run, right? right? I right. mean, that's, yeah. that's going to be hard. And the question to me remains, can Deshaun Watson ever return to 2020, right. 2019, Deshaun? Right. Because, I mean, does that guy look comfortable to you? He didn't look in rhythm. He did not look in rhythm and he did not look comfortable. But also went into that a little bit. His offensive line looked awful. Uh, now, I know the Pittsburgh Steelers and their defensive front uh, is very strong with Watts and, and – and Highsmith, but I just I just think that that offensive line has to sure up and give him some more time. Now he sat back there in the pocket, didn't really have a chance to throw downfield, uh, from what I've seen. So yes, he checked it down more than than usual. But you're going to have to do that in order to control the clock. So uh, with that said, though, Armando, let's let's go into um, disappointments in the AFC. We've just talked about Cleveland now, from what we've seen with Nick Chubb going down and Deshaun Watson and the struggles. Uh, in that first, really the first game and a half, because the first half of that Cincinnati game was awful, although it was bad weather. Uh, second game, he, second half, he played pretty well. But just give me your team or teams that you're disappointed in in the AFC. My number one disappointment in the entire NFL. Uh -oh. I'm not just going to give you AFC. I'm going to give you the entire league. Okay. Is the is the Los Angeles? Don't call me San Diego Chargers. <laughs> I mean. Dude, they are wasting Justin Herbert, their coach, Brandon Staley. I mean, I didn't think I didn't think he could do any worse than blowing that 27 to 7 halftime lead in the playoffs last year. Right. And right. here he is at the start of this season, and he's doing worse. <laughs> <They're> worse. <laughs> But let me add to that. I mean, Kellen Moore comes over from Dallas having one of the top-ranked offenses in the last couple of years and thinking having Justin Herbert, because everyone want to always talk bad about Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys, but having now Justin Herbert and, and Williams and, and you know, all of these weapons, Eckler and, and, and the wide receivers, and then having Everett at the tight end position, you know, you would think that they would come and kind of run a little bit more ball control and take shots downfield. But it seemed like they were just trying to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball with play action. 
is it more of Kellen Moore trying to get adjusted to Justin or is it just Brandon Staley just continue to mess things up? Well, I grant you Kellen Moore and, and Justin Herbert is a marriage still, you know, trying to understand each other, what time yeah. each other wakes up, yeah. who likes coffee, <laughs> who, you know, what, what side of the bed are we sleeping? All that stuff. Right. But Brandon Staley, he is a defensive coach, N not a mm -hmm. defensive as in sensitive, a defensive as in defensive minded, although he is kind of sensitive. You you <laughs> heard that 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 quote the other day in the in the press conference, right? Yes, we have yes that? you did. Yes. I'm not I'm not worried about the Jacksonville loss. The Jacksonville loss hasn't carried on to the season whatsoever. If you've seen our training camp or you've seen the way we've played in the first two games, it hasn't had an impact on our team whatsoever. Our team is connected. Our team has played its heart out in two games, and we've lost two tough games. But there's, it has nothing to do with the Jacksonville game. And if you ask anyone in our locker room, it has nothing to do with the Jacksonville game. And that's just the truth. It's a convenient storyline for you and for everybody else, but it's not the truth. We've lost two tough games, but the guys in that locker room, the men in that locker room, they are finishers and they have what it takes. And we're excited to prove ourselves. You know what that sounds like to me, Donovan? An insecure beta male. That's 100%. what that sounds like to me. Hundred percent. But you know what? Again, I will look at their team, and I just won't go to Brandon because obviously that's the easier one. And yes, he has struggled in decision making late in games uh, by going for it on fourth down in midfield, or uh, when you backed up, or you know deciding to throw the ball when it's third and one or third and two when you've been running the ball effectively. But let's look at their defense. Their defense has struggled over the last two seasons and, and really two and a half, to be honest with you, due to injuries. Big name players can't seem to stay healthy. What do you think? What do you attribute that to? Because they put so much money into their defense and they still haven't been able to execute. I'm not going to give you the injury excuse. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to. I need a hammer because I still am going to hammer, you know, my man Staley. He's a defense you. coach. He was yeah. a defensive coordinator. Look, let's just put it out there. Right. The Miami Dolphins threw Tua Tunga Vailoa threw for 466 yards. They played man coverage down after down after down against Tyreek Hill, who went off for 215 yards. Right. You know what Tyreek Hill did last week? Five catches, 40 yards against the New England Patriots. Why? Because their defensive coach decided, uh-uh, that's not going to happen. That, <laughs> no. But Brandon Staley, it was going to happen, and in right. no adjustments. Uh, right. I'm done with that guy. All right, let's 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 move on. I, I, my choice was the Cincinnati Bengals. I, I expected Cincinnati to elevate their game. Now, now you say we're not going to use the excuse of the injuries because if you're playing, you got to play effectively. But Joe Burrow, to me, like Deshaun Watson, just does not look in rhythm, just does not look comfortable. Uh, seems like he's not really recognizing and seeing the coverage that he expects in his pre-snap read. I'm expecting a little bit more out of Jamar Chase, uh, out of T. Higgins, although T. Higgins had two touchdowns late in the game against Baltimore uh, this past weekend. But more importantly, I mean, you got Joe Nixon. You, you have weapons in Tyler Boyd and – and Jamar Chase and Higgins, and then your tight end uh, has been so effective over the last two years. And it seems like Joe Burrow, to me, I don't know if he's just because he got the contract, people bring the contract part up, but he got the contract, and he just can't seem to put things together. I, I look at Joe Burrow, he's completing under 60% of his passes. Uh, he's thrown one pick and only two touchdowns in two games. Rushing-wise, they've only ran the ball 35 times for 141 yards. If your quarterback is struggling, you would think your offensive coordinator would decide to run the ball a little bit more to take the pressure off of you and maybe set up the play action game. And their defense just hasn't been the same. So I know people have been talking about where they were the last two seasons. This is a new year. And for a quarterback that's coming off of an injury, a calf injury, which we've seen with the Jets, with Aaron Rodgers having a calf injury coming back in, and we've seen what happened there, I'm expecting a little bit more out of the Cincinnati Bengals. So I'm going to say something crazy and, okay. and, and I'm going to say it to you because you're, you accept my crazy. It's not about, it is about the injury for Joe Burrow. It's about the calf injury. It's about not 
uh, playing during training camp and the preseason. Boom. It's it's all about that for him because when he doesn't practice, when he doesn't get the full Rep. A to Z, you know, uh, ability to prepare, he's right. not Joe Burrow. And right. furthermore, because it is a leg injury, I would say to you, 50% of the quarterbacks who struggle, struggle not because of their arm, right. but because of their legs. Russell Wilson last year, that was a leg problem. Dan Marino at the end of his career, legs. Uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you're the quarterback, right? Yeah. Legs, kind of important. Uh, you know what's funny? And uh, being a quarterback and working with quarterbacks, I'm watching a lot of these guys and their techniques as they train, where they're training pretty much of utilizing all arm, no legs. Uh, and so as they're throwing, you just watch them kind of push and extend and throw instead of utilizing your full body and, and following through uh, with your throws, a la what you see pitchers doing. Now, all of a sudden, you get an ankle injury, you get a, a hamstring injury, you get a calf injury, and guys just rely back on their arms. And when you rely back on your arm, then balls would tend, have a tendency of being behind, being low, being high. And then when you recognize the coverage late, then all of a sudden you want to power to throw into a tight window, which leads to either interceptions, either leads to tip balls, uh, or just inaccurate throws. So, yes, I see this being a trend throughout the league now, not just with Joe Burrow, but with throughout the league. I'm watching these guys. Look, I mean, look what, look what happened to Buffalo against the Jets in the first game of the year. I mean, you would have thought that with they, Buffalo had a new quarterback. I mean, but when Josh Allen gets out there and he's trying to throw air balls deep when he's got guys wide open underneath, but he's not utilizing his legs in that regard, you're not putting more pressure on your your team as well as trying to sustain those drives that come out with points. So we took a big dump on a couple of teams. Who are your teams that you really like right now? Well, you know what? Uh, to be honest with you, in the AFC – you know, I, I'm I'm impressed with a lot of different teams. I'm I'm impressed with with more of the teams that decide to run the football. And when I say decide to run the football, that means they're taking pressure off of their quarterbacks. And so I think I think I look at guys that like I'm I'm a big fan of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And when I say the Jacksonville Jaguars, people are gonna come at me and go, "Oh, what are you talking about?" I'm like. I like what Doug Peterson has started over there. Now take away take away a little bit of I would say a, a half of that that uh, Kansas City game. I thought what I seen from Kansas from excuse me Jacksonville running ETN, utilizing the quick game, trying to get the ball in in uh, Ridley's hands, trying to get the ball to their tight end in Ingram. What we seen last year, I'm seeing it carry over a bit, and their defense is playing well. Also, I mean. Who can who can not mention the Miami Dolphins? Listen, Tua Tonga Valonga, I think, will get paid this year if he stays healthy. He will be the 40 million, 42 million type of quarterback because I think he throws for 5,000, staying healthy now, throwing for 5,000, and Tariq Hill will be at about 1850 as far as the receiving yards are concerned. That's strong. That is strong, and you know I'm I'm from the 305, sir. So that's why uh, I give you a little bit of love now. I give you a little bit of love. Yep, 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 <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, so who are having, your teams? San Francisco 49ers. Okay, uh, that's the team that I'm picking to win it all. Of course, they play on Thursday, so now they'll come out and play like poo, and <laughs> it'll be terrible because right. Mondo said that they're good, and so it's right. going to be terrible. But right. I look at the way that that team is is put together, and dude, I I love it. Let me let me run some stuff by you. All right. So they've got the highest paid non quarterback, the highest paid running back, the third highest paid offensive tackle, the highest paid fullback, the third right. highest paid tight end, the third highest paid inside linebacker, the sixth highest paid interior lineman, and a seventh highest paid wide receiver. Why can they load up like that? Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up, but paying all that money don't don't make you win a championship. Washington, Washington back then, the Redskins, now Commanders, um, 
they weren't able to succeed in doing that. Remember bringing in Dion and bringing in Bruce Smith and Mike Carrier, Mark Carrier, and those yeah. guys. Like, although they were older, they were older. But I look at in the NFC, and you bring it up. The NFC to me starts with Philadelphia, ends with Philadelphia, and I'm not just saying that being biased because obviously, you know, you see the oh no, you, you see you see the 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 Eagles helmet there. But I just think when it comes to Philadelphia, and this game is going to happen in a couple of weeks. But again, you do all that that you mentioned with the high price. Brock Purdy's still Mr. Irre- Irrelevant. He's still Mr. Irrelevant. And so I'm, I need to see him in big games be able to elevate that team to get over that hump. Now, take it, it'll just be a regular season game. But I still need to see him be put in that position because experience is a major factor in the success of any player at a key position to be able to elevate the guys behind him. So when you come to NFC and you mention San Fran, where do you see Dallas? Do you put Dallas in that in that mode? I put all three of those teams, you know, Dallas, Philadelphia, and San Francisco up above everybody else. But I just think Dallas and Philadelphia, they're going to pound on each other for a little bit. And San Francisco's over there on the West Coast going to the surfing, going to the right. beach, <laughs> hanging out. Right. You know, and, right. and I just think it's going to be better for them. And by the way, the Brock Purdy point, you're right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's inarguable. He hasn't proven nothing. Right. But the reason that they can pay all these other guys who are in their prime is because he, of that. Is because he's the 80th paid quarterback in yeah. the NFL. <laughs> 80th. Exactly. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. And staying in that division, to be honest with you, do you see the Seattle Seahawks being a threat? I like Geno Smith. I think Geno is one of the sleeper picks as far as being able to carry this team, not just for a wild card spot, but really battling to win that division. I think only thing that I worry about is the Seattle defense. Now, I love Bobby, Bobby Wagner being back, but I like what I'm seeing from Geno in that offense. But on defense, with Witherspoon and Wagner and, and the pass rush that they have, I'm expecting big things from Seattle uh, in that division to be able to battle and possibly dethroning, really, San Fran, to win that division. What are your thoughts? You know, Smith from South Florida. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> just, I'm going to say like it, it every single time. Okay. <laughs> you know that. Uh, they have maybe, probably, the best coach in the division. Right. Fair? Fair. Uh, I mean, Fair. Pete Carroll, who's better Fair. than him in that division? And I know McVay is going to get a lot of love. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm outcoached by... The Patriots. True. I, True. I, I know the Shanahan tree is amazing, right. but Pete Carroll's awesome. He's a he's a future Hall of Famer, and I'm going to vote for him when Agreed. I get the chance. Agree. So I'm just just kind of going forward as as we stay into uh, the NFC and AFC. Uh, do you think that just not playing in the preseason has has kind of hurt a lot of these teams? Because we we talked about in the beginning the San Fran's, the Dallas, uh, the Eagles in the NFC, and then we were expecting the Kansas City Chiefs, the Cincinnati Bengals, Baltimore with with the acquisition of bringing Odell and Zay Flowers coming over there and a new offensive coordinator from Georgia. Uh, and, and then also mentioning possibly in the AFC, the, the Los Angeles Chargers. Do you think not playing in the preseason has hurt a lot of these teams right now from being that success story in the first two weeks? I think it hurt the Bills. Um, I think, you know, and Josh Allen did play in the preseason. Uh, but obviously he wasn't ready for the opener. No. Uh, you know, it, I, I'm not a coach. I don't know how to how to balance. You tell me, man. I'm sure that you weren't in love with getting hit in the preseason when it didn't count. Well, one thing when I played, we didn't have the inner squad scrimmages during the week. You know, we practiced against each other, and I think that's the way to go because game time, it's a different mentality. The adrenaline is running. You're so happy to see another uh, another jersey, another body to, to battle against. Uh, I, I just think that was kind of, that element was taken away because now you have the inner squad scrimmages thinking that we're getting all our work done during the week, and then all of a sudden come game day, we'll let the twos and threes and fours play. 
No, that's not how it goes. Like, I like the way Kansas City did it. And Kansas City did it, obviously, with Andy Reid, uh, former coach of mine. He allowed his team to play. So the first game they played, I believe, two series. The second game they played uh, a half. And then the third series, or third game they played uh, a half and a series. Uh, and so I thought just taking away from that first game, because obviously Tony's still dropping the ball at this point. Uh, but the second game with having Kelsey back and then having, having their defensive tackle back, where now they have all of their guys there, we start to see a little bit more what Kansas City is all about. And I think that's what the recipe should be. The recipe should be that your starters play in every preseason game, maybe not the last to allow those threes and fours to, to kind of shine and get some videotape for either opposing teams or if you're on a bubble. But I think we're seeing the kind of the result of teams not playing in the preseason and that's what these first five to six weeks are going to be them working the kinks out. You're going to have your phone blow up by a bunch of NFL players complaining to you. What are you talking about playing the preseason? <laughs> What's that about? Right. You know, these young guys, they, you know, I'm just the old guy sitting on the lawn <laughs> complaining, but that's, that's what it's about. It's about being able to get those reps and kick the rust off to be ready for when the whistle blows. So, I mean, I, I just think for the NFL, I think it's more of a dark, dark cloud over the NFL right now because, yes, you have 17 games. But yet still, I think there were guys in the in the training camps that didn't make the team because they weren't able to play in the preseason. And, and this is where we're going to be for the next four to five weeks of teams still trying to figure themselves out. Well, they better, they better hurry up because December is coming and January is <laughs> coming. And, you know, you get yourself... The New York Giants got off to a 60 to nothing deficit to start the season. Uh, exactly. Wake up. Ex Alarm. Hey, Daniel Jones got paid this, this past summer. So, I mean, speaking of quarterbacks, let, let's just go with the, the list of quarterbacks right now that you're worried about. Give me two quarterbacks that you're worried about for their future. And one in the AFC, one in the NFC. I'm worried about Justin Fields. Um, I, I'm not sure that he's feeling the system. Right. I'm not sure that he processes very well. I mean, there was a play the other day where he's in the pocket waiting and there's a guy running down the seam wide open and he didn't see him. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, that's not good. <laughs> that's and of course, he doesn't get the best protection in the world, although they did a lot of work on that offensive line. Right. But you got to maximize when that's the situation. And this is year, I believe, three for him. Yeah. It's time. You're, yeah. It's time. And, you know, we're not going to be talking next year about, well, it's the coach's fault because he's on his second coach already. We're not going to be talking about it's the offensive line's fault because they've addressed that to a certain degree. We're, the The focus is going to go, you know, Justin right Fields. It's on you, brother. What's up? You know, I, I watched Justin and he looks he looks really uncomfortable. I don't know if the offense is suited around his ability, but he does look uncomfortable. And you know, I don't know the progression. I don't know the reads, but. Uh, there were videos of, of, of guys running open um, and his eyes were off to the opposite side and having a little bit of time, not being able to peruse the field and, and go through his reads and progressions. And maybe he would have found a guy laying sitting by the sideline or running down the middle of the field. Uh, but I, you know, I look at, I look at NFC and, and yes, Justin Fields comes to mind first and foremost, but more I, I look at in the AFC and people always want to pound on Russell. And I'm not going to pound on Russell because I think Russell Will Russell Wilson is a Hall of Fame quarterback. He's uh, he's a guy that now this year, statistically, I mean, when you talk statistically of what he's been able to do, I mean, here's a guy that's passed for 68% completion percentage. He's got 485 yards, five tuds, one pick. He's been sacked nine times. That's the, that's the problem a little bit with Russell when he's trying to be creative instead of just getting the ball out to his checkdowns. But more importantly, Sean Payton was brought over there to help Russell 
elevate his game. But in the first two weeks of the season, everyone wants to look at the Denver Broncos. It's not Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson had leads in those games going in the fourth quarter. The defense gave up two to three touchdowns in the fourth quarter or in the second half alone to lose those games. Uh, and so I, I look at more of, I worry about Russell because I think from a media standpoint, the fan standpoint, uh, they're going to be barking of it's time for Russell to go and then they'll bring up his contract. But in actuality, it's not Russell's fault why they lost. It's more the defense being able to hold and they got to clean that up fast. Yeah, it's weird. So the, the man, the Broncos are, are a strange, strange situation. Yeah. To from Fangio, you know, to Hackett and now Sean Payton. That they got the second best head coach in, in Colorado. Right. Uh, so yeah. I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Sean. Oh, oh no, we'll get to that now. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Oh, uh, it, look, it's going to take a while for that, right. that culture to kind of mesh. And right. you're absolutely right. The defense, they need work. They right. need work. And, and Russell is the, is the, is the punching bag that everybody, True. you know, wants to. It's all on Russell, all on Russell. It's like, everybody's jealous of him and his wife, Sierra. And it seems like they just find ways to come down on Russell. Uh, and, and it's a shame. It's a shame that, that Russell is going through that. I mean, no, we, listen, last year was last year. Uh, that was just an awful experience with, with Hatchet and those guys. And, and then Russell trying to do too much. Uh, I thought the offense that Sean Payton was bringing over was best suited for him, best suited for what, what the, the talent that they had. Now, they were missing Judy. In, in week one, Judy came back last week uh, and had some splash plays. Uh, but I expected a little bit more with Williams coming back in the running back position for him uh, to take pressure off. And and they put up points. They have put up points, but the defense has to play better. And let, let's go to I mean, stay in Colorado because you you definitely uh, led us into that. Give me your thoughts on on the whole spat with uh, Norville and, and, and Deion Sanders with Colorado versus Colorado State. It was fun. You yeah. know, I mean, did yeah. it really mean something? I'm not sure that when that game was in overtime or at the point where Colorado needed that 90 yard or 97 yard drive, right? That they were thinking that coach over there is a jerk. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that that's what was going on. I think Dion has done a great job of bringing attention to the program. Right. It's going to help his recruiting. Right. But I also think that, you know, serious business is coming. It's coming. USC is coming. Oregon <laughs> is coming. Utah is coming. Right. They're not Colorado State. That's all I got to say about that. Well, <laughs> It's, it's one game at a time. I think, let me go to f different phases. As far as Dion is concerned, Dion has brought more positive light to college football because what college football has done at this particular point is now have they have made a makeshift of all different conferences and have just kind of put everything in a pot and stirred it up. You have teams going to the Big 12 all the way from the West Coast. You've got teams going to the Big 10 all the way from the West Coast. You have teams from down South playing now you know, playing up, up north or out west. And so I, I just think for where college football, the landscape of college football, where it's at, Dion has brought some excitement brought back to college football. Yes, Caleb Williams, we can talk Caleb and, and winning the Heisman. And, and we can talk May from North Carolina being in the Heisman Trophy candidate. You know, but other than that, no one talks really about college football. Alabama's struggling. You know, Texas beat Alabama. Now, is Texas the new darling? Uh, I... I would say no. Michigan, no one talks about Michigan with McCarthy, but then you got, you know, Harbaugh being suspended for the first four weeks. Uh, Georgia, Georgia didn't look good at all in the first two weeks. Yes, they're 2-0, and oh, but this isn't the same type of team that we've seen over the last four years. Uh, so the, list, the landscape of college football, at least Dion brings light to it. Now, as far as the spat is concerned, Norville went too far. He went too far. And and being a guy that that his program has really struggled over the last four or five years, 
he brought some positivity to him, but then you didn't have to call him out. And, and when you call Dion out, I mean, yeah, Dion's going to make entertainment out of it. And, you know, I think what it led to is the players now having animosity on the field, and which led to that hit on, on Travis Hunter, uh, which I still think he should be suspended. The safety should be suspended uh, for at least four games for that. Now, does that happen in college? No, but that's unacceptable. That's truly unacceptable. He wasn't and, even flagged, I don't think, right? I and mean, he was he... not even flagged. Not even flagged. And neither was the hit on Shador, Shador Sanders when he dumped him into the ground, which we see the NFL. If you sneeze on a quarterback now, that's going to cost you cost you money and suspension. So I just think overall, you bring up the two games. I think they beat Oregon. I think Colorado beats Oregon. And I think they struggle a little bit with the USC. The problem with USC is, their defense is awful. Offensively, yes, they have splash players on offense. But defense has been giving up 500 yards in games that they, they struggled in the in the first game of the year. Yes, Caleb Williams put on a remarkable performance. But the defense just gave up entirely too many yards and points where it was a battle for at least three quarters. Uh, so I think it'll be exciting going forward just what college football is right now. You know what Dion has done? He's made the Colorado Buffalo – Buffalo's a national team. That's yep. never happened. It's like right. Colorado Buffaloes. Are you serious, right. dude? I mean, <laughs> come on. Uh, you know, but he's made them a national team. And I got to tell you, you know, the, the biggest compliment that people give each other is when they copy each other. Exactly. And what he has done, he's turned that program around by doing certain things with the transfer portal and, and stuff like that. I mean, didn't he bring in like, you know, 50 new players? 50 new players. New pl How many? 50, I think 51 new players or so. <laughs> you think that he's the last guy that's going to do that now? No, no. <laughs> that's going to be a thing now. It is. That's and it's, it's killing high school football. It's killing high school recruiting. Because now coaches can go right into the portal and grab a guy who's already understood the college aspect of the work ethic and, and morning workouts and lifting and things of that nature. Instead of going to get a guy to develop him more, now you go get a guy and just kind of shift his, his style of play to fit your system and organization. Uh, and he, he could be a sophomore, he could be a junior, he could be a graduate uh, that has one more year. But you're not wasting that time of trying to develop the young kid from high school. It's going to continue to hurt the high school kids going forward uh, as far as recruiting is concerned. So for you young guys out there, continue to put in that work. You, your work ethic has to be at the elite level in order to be seen and to be respected to get that offer and to get that time to get to, to these universities. And so Armando, I mean, our first show has been outstanding. Uh, this has been one that we're going to continue to go strong. Hey, you know, it's a good start. It's a good start. We came out the blocks running. We got to watch the tape. I got to watch we'll, the tape. We'll, we'll, we'll watch the tape like Brandon Staley, your favorite, uh, yeah. and see if we can make some changes. Uh, but just <laughs> make sure you tune in uh, this week as well for our, our second show. Uh, there'll be a lot more of the who's, the why's, and the wins. Things will happen. Uh, and we'll break that down. Join us here again at the Five Spots.